You better stop or I won't be able to speak. <laughs> you know, someone asked me today, uh, don't, doesn't it make you feel humble and overwhelmed that uh, 10,400 glorious people are going to be spending an evening with you? And I said, you bet it makes me feel humble. But more than that, it excites me beyond belief. I'm just about ready to go into orbit. I don't know about you. But uh, if, if you see me levitate, join me. You know, it'll be great up there. We've got lots of room to move around in. But the thing that most of all it reminds me of is that I know for sure, again, I've had it, had it reassured, that love is alive and well and living in Chicago. Uh, I, I came well equipped, and this happens first. And then we're ready to go. You know, the most amazing things happen to me in this city all the time. There's something about my vi vibrations and Chicago's vibrations that just fit together like magic. And uh, every time I, I come to Chicago, I leave with a thousand stories to tell. And last time when I was here in October, uh, I was on the Donahue show, and after the show was over, I love walking down Michigan Avenue. There's something stimulating about that street, all those vibrations, and the taxi cabs, and the people. And I was walking along, and all, all at once I heard the screeching of, of tires, you know, and like what we all do, I had an instantaneous response. I turned around to look, and I noticed that a taxi cab had stopped, and a man had thrown open the door, the driver of the taxi, and he said, Boscalozzi! <laughs> What the hell are you doing in Chicago? <laughs> you know, I sort of backed away, and he comes rushing toward me, leaving his taxi there with the passengers inside, you know, and he says, oh, I, I've got to have my hug. So we're out on the sidewalk there hugging, and, and then he says, you know, my wife isn't going to believe this. She isn't going to believe it at all. He said, do you mind if I take a picture? And, you know, in the meantime, traffic is backing up, everybody's honking, and he nonchalantly walks in, pulls out a camera, and then gets one of his passengers to take the picture of us together. <laughs> it was fantastic. And I've been using that story all year because it's wonderful, because you know how I love to collect stories about a name? Didn't matter, what's, what's the difference if he called me Buscaloosie if there was so much love, you know? I've been doing a wonderful thing since I saw you last. For the last four years, I have been accumulating wonderful material on loving relationships for uh, a new book. And I'm interested in asking people, what is it about your relationships that keep them growing and keep them loving and keep them stimulating? And what makes them last? And then I want to ask people, what destroys them? Because it really bothers me that so many of us are lonely and we don't know how to maintain a relationship. It's, 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 you know, if we wanted to learn any skill in the world, we'd go out and we'd study it diligently. If we wanted to learn how to use a computer. But all of us think that we are perfect lovers, and therefore we really don't have much to do in terms of forming a relationship. We see this beautiful person across a crowded room and we say, you and you live happily ever after. You know, the sad part about it is that that's a beautiful myth, but it doesn't work. Uh, the magical thing is that it works for so many of us. And so I sent out a thousand questionnaires to people who had maintained a loving relationship for something like 20, 30, 40 years. And I asked them, what was it 
What did you do? Because I'd love to share it with people. Everyone is so hungry to know how to maintain these things. And you know, I received 600 responses, which is statistically unheard of. And they were filled out. They had things in the margin and pictures on the back and, and diagrams to show. You know, it was the most beautiful thing to see. And, and I realized that all of these people uh, were beautiful lovers. And I go all over the country and I meet incredible people who are beautiful lovers. And then I get about a thousand letters a month from beautiful lovers. And you know, the good news is, is that our country is full of beautiful lovers. But the bad news is that it's probably the best kept secret in the world. You know, I'm always asking, where are you? Why aren't you showing yourself? When I appear in public, inevitably, if I'm on a talk show or something, somebody has got to say, uh, this is Dr. Biscaglia. He has a PhD. You know, that sort of makes it respectable that I'm there talking about love. You know, who needs a PhD to love? Mama had a fifth grade education. She was the biggest, most wondrous lover I've ever known. All 200 pounds of her. She was gorgeous, and she didn't need a PhD, but it was respectable as far as she was concerned. It doesn't seem quite respectable in terms of our own culture. Uh, every time I'm interviewed, people say to me, you're advocating loving everyone. And it seems to me that that is unrealistic. You know, and my answer to them is, well, whom would you suggest that I discard? <laughs> you know, and for what reason? I really would like an answer to that question. How can I help but love you? You're me. The interesting thing, I was reading a review of a, of a biography of the wonderful author William Saroyan. Some of you know him, but he was so fantastic because all of his books dealt with people like you and me. Uh, the, the, poor and, and the struggling and the lonely and the despairing and the out of work and, and so on and so on. Beautiful stuff showing you how human love can overcome all of these things. And this reviewer actually said, so much goodness and kindness just doesn't work these days. Putting the book down. Gordon Allport, wonderful psychologist, calls this a tenderness taboo. Isn't that interesting? A taboo against being tender. And really, if you love, you're considered naive. If you're happy, you're considered frivolous and simple. Think about it, when you hear people having a good time, you think they either must be drunk or worthless. <laughs> if you're generous, you're considered suspect. Everybody's saying, what's in it for him? You know, what's he doing? Why is he giving that away? We're expecting something back. If you're forgiving, you're considered weak. And if you're trusting, you're considered a fool. Well, if all of these wonderful values are put down in our culture, then where are our kids going to learn? So it's about time that we start becoming militant as lovers. I, I just, uh, about a year or so ago, I found a young lady, a beautiful young lady, uh, cribbing on an exam. She had everything all written out in front of her, you know, and uh, I, I didn't want to make a big fuss about it, but I wrote a little note and I put it on her desk. I said, see me after class. And when everyone had left, I sat down with her and I said, you know, it's not that big a deal. Um, what are you doing this for? And you know what she said to me? So what? I don't care. What's all the fuss? Dio mio. <laughs> What's all the fuss? I, you know that I, I, I make it mandatory that everybody in my classes get out of themselves and get into other people. Go out and do something for someone. You begin to find out who you are when you are selfless. And I get comments like, why should I help others? God helps those that help themselves. <laughs> you know, the wonderful psychologist Piaget did a, an incredible study with little children. And this is very frightening. He told them a story and he said, two little boys did something really, really bad. And mama came in and she said, which one did this? And one of them accused the other, and the other accused the other. And she believed the elder son. And so she spanked the kid. And then he asked uh, these children, who was wrong? 
You know what they said? The one that got caught. <laughs> That's very frightening for me. But you know, I'm still very optimistic about the future. Kenneth Galbraith says a wonderful thing. He says, pessimism in our time is infinitely more respectable than optimism. The man who sees the decline in juvenile delinquency is a negligent, a fool, and a foolish fellow. The man who foresees catastrophe, oh goodness, has the gift of insight which will assure that he will become a famous radio commentator, the editor of Time magazine, or go to Congress. You know, when I was in Chicago a couple of years ago and was interviewed by John Calloway, that marvelous man, and he has a great way of getting into the closets where you keep your skeletons. There's no way in which you can hide anything from John. He does it nicely, he does it gently, but he gets in there and there you are exposed, you know, on national television. And he asked me a question that I had never thought about before. He said, you know, Buscaglia, you feel so passionately about people caring about each other, about people coming close together. Why aren't you more political? And I, you know, I thought about John, you want me to run for president? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, if that happened, I'd run so fast. <laughs> but it was a very interesting thing, and so, Coming back to Chicago tonight, I decided to call this talk The Politics of Love. And I'm advocating that love be the candidate and that we be the people who get it all started and see what we can do. You know, if 10,000 people tomorrow make life more beautiful for 10,000 other people, just one other person, we could turn this city around. Get on the phone, write a note. Really do it, do something concrete that's gonna make a difference and then see what happens. Let me know, it'll be really exciting. But we've gotta start reinforcing it. So I'm starting by saying, lovers, get out of the closet. <laughs> Let people know that you're there. Let them see you. Run the risk of being seen as crazy because the minute you start behaving lovingly, people are going to look at you like you really are weird. We have a, a home for the aging uh, very near our home, and I love to go there and talk to the people because there's so much to know and see. And so many people there are seen as crazy because they do really nice things. There's one woman who is about as tall as I am, very slim, very beautiful. Her hair is pulled back, and she's always very clean. And we call her the pigeon woman. And we call her the pigeon woman because she sees to it that every single pigeon in that neighborhood eats a gourmet meal at least once a day. <laughs> and you know, the neighbors go crazy because they don't like the pigeons. You know, they're, they're letting their little blasphemies all over the place. <laughs> And people talk about it eating away the paint and so on and so forth. But you know, pigeons have got to live too. And this woman has a real sense of that. And, and it's wonderful to watch her early in the morning because I'm sure that she devours everybody's leftover toast and everything and puts them in her little apron. And uh, she's been told, because the neighbors have complained, that she is not to feed the, the, the poor pigeons. But she creeps out, and you see her at morning after morning, and she walks out there, and all the pigeons are waiting, you know, burr, burr, burr. Well, here she comes, kids. She walks out there, and they just come from miles around, just huge, and she reaches in her pocket, and she really quickly, you know, she feeds these pigeons like crazy all over the place, and inevitably, here comes the attendant. You know, grabs her by the arm. Now, we told you, Mary, you are not to feed the pigeons, but she's got a wonderful, satisfied look on her face. As she walks away, you know, I've done it for today. Now let's see what happens tomorrow, you know. <laughs> In a very real sense, Papa was always considered crazy. You know, he planted this garden and he used to, everything in gardens grow at once. You know, all the tomatoes, all the zucchini, all the, everything he ever grew, all grew at once. Well, he was going to share it. And he'd go to people on the street and say, uh, you know, you like some zucchini. And they were sure there was something uh, how much do you want for them? Nothing. They're yours, you know. And, and everyone looked upon him as really being strange, giving things away. Uh, that isn't the way it's done, you know. But Papa did it all the time. He never cheated on his income tax. Of course, he didn't have much income. <laughs> and he was the only one that I know who used to insist 
every time the teacher came that she sat down and eat because she was so skinny. <laughs> but he was considered to be crazy. But you know, St. Francis was considered to be crazy. Jesus of Nazareth was considered to be crazy. Buddha was considered to be crazy. Uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw in his wonderful play, St. Joan, at the end of the play, after they've killed Joan, burned her at the stake, she comes back again and has a discourse with the audience. And the discourse ends with one of the most beautiful lines in literature. She says, oh God, when will the world be ready to accept its saints? Oh God, when? Good question. Edward Blishen, talking about children, says, the, word, the world must be mastered, well enough at any rate, for the child to be able to make its way through it as a reasonably competent human being. And to do this, there is a great deal to be known and a great balance to be sought. The balance between the inward person and the outward person, between the vast and awful possibilities of the imagination and the reality which is bearable simply because it is real. The adult represents to the child that this balance can be achieved. So, if we're cheating, if we're lying, if we're deceptive, if we're unloving, if we're prejudiced, if we're bitter, that's what we're modeling for our kids and for each other and for society, and that's why we're all so suspicious. You know, one of the things I do in my counseling classes at the university is I always gather them up and we go on a field trip to the general hospital. And we go to the psychiatric ward. And I say, look, you know, these are very young kids and they're afraid, they're appalled. They don't understand that there are people, young people in their 16s and 17s and 18s and 20s and 30s rocking, spending the rest of their lives rocking, staring into space, curled up in a little ball back in the fetal position, disappearing because the world has already become such a painful place for them. And then I take them to the wards where they have child abuse cases. And they find we, we, there's a little girl who's, whose parents, because she reached for something she wasn't supposed to, actually chopped her hand off. Uh, black and blue little children, one that was scalded in a bathtub. And of course, this just builds and builds. And when we're through, it isn't just there. We go out and we sit together in the lawn. And I say to them, well, what do you think? You know, and of course they come off and they say, who are these terrible people that do things to people that make them fall into those states of despair and insanity? And I'm a brutal teacher. I say, we are. We are they. Because by not developing our capacity to love and by not demonstrating it, we're perpetuating that violence and that hate and that pain. If there's going to be a change, it's going to have to be done by us. We all know what needs to be done. Everybody in this audience could conceivably have a beautiful definition of what it means to be a lover. You know what it is. Why aren't we doing it? That's the question. What's the use of knowing something when you don't put it into action? You know, I had a Buddhist teacher once that said to me, to know and not to do is not really yet to know. You'll know that you're a lover when you begin to act at being a lover. And there is so much material to cover if you're going to be a lover. In fact, there's so much material, it reminds me of like a, a, a mosquito in a nudist colony. There's so much tempting stuff to talk about. <laughs> but the first thing that we're going to have to do if we're going to decide we're going to be lovers is you're going to have to develop your sense of humor. Because my goodness, people are going to treat you strangely and you're going to have to learn how to accept it with a good laugh. Humor is a wonderful anecdote to cruelty and to rejection and to distrust and to condescension. You know, the wonderful comedian Victor Borga says that the closest distance between two people is a good laugh. I love that. And you know, Mama taught us that early. She laughed all the time. It used to drive Papa crazy. <laughs> He'd come home with all kinds of despairing things and she'd get the giggles. And you know, there is nothing so contagious as laughter. Try it sometime. Just sit there and laugh. And pretty soon everyone around you, even though they didn't know that they're laughing at, they're roaring with laughter. We were on the floor wondering what Mama was laughing at. She didn't know. 
It was just, the whole thing was just funny. You know, sometimes I think you have really become wise when you recognize that life is a great, big, wondrous joke, and you're at the center of it. You're the funniest thing of all. Have you ever watched? <laughs> Have you ever watched human behavior? It's, it's hysterical. You know, I, I, all during the summer, I've been traveling all over the place. And like you know, I love to sit in airports and watch human behavior. Here's the family going on the much needed holiday. You know, here's mama and here's papa and here are the six kids. And what is on a leash? <laughs> and the others are all over the airport. And papa's saying to mama, get those kids together. The plane's about to leave. Where's Joe? He had to go to the toilet. <laughs> toilet! We're going to miss the flight. And the kids are saying, I don't want to go. <laughs> and the other one's saying, when are we going to get there? <laughs> I'm thirsty. Well, you can drink on the plane. I want something to drink now. Oh, they're having such a good time. <laughs> you see? You see Mama walk on the flight, you know, and she's had it. They haven't even taken off yet. Uh, I was recently at a concert. It was hilarious. And there was this man. He was determined to be the first one in the concert hall. Now, I can't explain why. But they opened the door, and there was this man pushing everybody aside with his poor wife on his arm. You know, she's pulling her through. And they get inside. Then he waits for an hour. You know, human behavior, if it weren't so marvelous, you know, we'd all just freak out. <laughs> you know, St. Teresa of Avila had a wonderful philosophy. She said, no nun will be a part of our order unless she likes to sleep, she likes to eat, and she likes to laugh. I'd have been a good nun for her. <laughs> because she said, if you like to eat, you're usually healthy. If you sleep and you like to sleep, you usually have no big sins on your soul, you know? And if you love to laugh, you will always be saved. You know, for years and years and years, I was told, now, Buscaglia, you must be serious. You must go, you must plant your two feet firmly on the ground if you're ever going to get anywhere. Well, you know, with my feet firmly pant planted on the ground, I couldn't get my pants on. <laughs> Flying in the air, I can get them on any time, in any position. Abraham Lincoln said, people are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Isn't that nice? You know, don't expect others to make you happy. You create the joy and watch what happens. You'll be the one that's dancing through life and laughing through life. It's such a nice place to be. And isn't it interesting that people certainly are happy in all kinds of situations we can't understand. There are poor people that are happy. There are ill people that are happy. There are disabled people that are seriously disabled that are happy. Even among the dying, I have known happy people, which tells us something we should all know, and that is it isn't the situation that makes you happy. It's you that makes you happy. I was on a plane recently with a woman who had just lost her husband two weeks before, and she was going to visit her children. And she said some beautiful things to me. The two of us cried together. You should see me on airplanes. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I have such an incredible time. It's such a nice, unique moment where we can share intimacy. And then you say goodbye, and you may never see each other again. But she told me about her life with her husband and about her kids and so on and so forth. Then she said, you know, Leo, the hardest time is at night. During the day, I'm busy. I don't think about it. But at night, when things are quiet and dark, and there's nobody to be near you, then you realize the import of bringing people close. And she said, especially after 35 years of having somebody close, just as far as a hand. And she said, you know, when I go back to my kids, I know they're going to try to make Mama happy. They're trying to make her, going to try her, make her smile. My kids are sweet and they're wonderful, but they can't make me happy. Only I can make myself happy again. 
That got us the cry again. <laughs> but how wonderful when you take full responsibility for your joy. Uh, just about two weeks ago, I received a letter that I want to share with you. And uh, this was from a woman, a very young woman, with a small family who, who found out at her very young age uh, that she was dying of cancer. And she said the strangest thing happened when she was told and she told her family. She said everybody rallied around her. All at once her husband, who had never shown real affection, became very affectionate. Her kids hugged her and kissed her, and they relieved her of all kinds of mundane duties that she had to do all the time. And she said, then I found that I had a lot of free time to think about things. And the one thing that occurred to me was that I was living with a stranger. This is a quote. And the stranger was me. She says, what was I going to do? I was absolutely alone. And I said to the stranger inside of me, you know, we still have time left to get to know each other. So I started to deal with the things I think and the things I choose and the things I love and the books I read. And I decided that these were the things that would get me to know me. And in so doing, Leo, I met a fantastic person, me. The best thing I learned after knowing I had to give up everything was that all that I really had had in the first place was what I was. And she ended her letter with this line, like I told you, I don't have long to live, but I've never been so happy and so alive. So if we're going to be lovers, we've got to take full responsibility for our lives. And you know, I understand that life is what you've been given. It's not always what you would want, but it's yours, and there it is. You know, uh, certainly we're all created equal in the eyes of God. But you're naive if you think we're all created equal. Some of you are geniuses. Some people are mentally retarded. Some of you are absolutely, according to our standards, ravishingly beautiful. Some are ravishingly plain. <laughs> you know, some of, some of you are big boned, and some of you are little boned. And if you're big boned, there isn't much you can do about it. You know, you could do Jane Fonda's workout until you turn purple. You're still going to have big hips. I remember as a kid, I was really tall and really skinny. It didn't matter that Mama fed me and fed me and fed me. I was really skinny. I grew very fast. And I envied all of my friends that really had rippling muscles and were the big macho kind, you know. And I'd see them in gym, and I felt so really ashamed of this skinny little body. And it was because it was like this, you know. <clears throat> And, and I was trying to find ways of helping myself. And at that time, the big popular thing which, uh, was Charles Atlas. Remember Charles Atlas? And, he thought, and it, you, they used to have that little cartoon that showed the little skinny one with whom I identified right down the line. And this big guy was throwing sand on his girlfriend. And then it says, many days, or 30 days later, and here's this huge guy and the guy throws sand and watch out. You know, and I thought, ah, oh, that's for Buscaglia. And so I saved all my pennies. You know, at that time I was, I was selling, uh, it, it, it ages me, but Liberty Magazine doesn't even exist anymore. Saturday Evening Post with a little thing like this. Oh, it was wonderful, door to door. At that time, you know, it wasn't on the stand. You'd knock on the, did I learn about behavior? <laughs> you know, I had to learn fast. But I learned that there were good things, there were bad things, you know, that was all good. But I, I, I remember I took all my savings and I sent for Charles Atlas, uh, you know, his program. And it came in a brown envelope. They promised you that. <laughs> you know, and I remember going in my room and opening it up and pulling it out, and I was, I was amazed 
You know, here was Charles in all of his majestic glory. And, and it said, now this is what you have to do. And it was called, I even remember, it was called dynamic tension. Do you know I dynamic tension myself practically into a hospital? <laughs> I was still never chosen for the baseball team. I was still skinny. So there are some things that we just have to accept. That's the way it is. That's the way it was given. You know, another thing I couldn't do anything about and didn't want to, but as a kid it was a problem, is that I was an Italian and I was so different. I was brought up in a totally different society. All of my friends ate hamburgers. They'd say, what did you have? I'd say, I had the risotto. <laughs> you had what? Risotto. What else did you have? I had polenta. Polenta. I never heard of polenta. What's polenta? You know, I remember I used to go to school with my little brown bag and everybody had ham and, you know, cheese and everything. And I had calamari. <laughs> and I had this little sandwich with all these creepy crawlies going. I loved it. They'd say, what's that? You know, I'd say, it's octopus. Octopus! <laughs> Pascalia eats octopus! You know, we all had to put up with that. They didn't know. It was good. I love it. It's passion. And at Christmas time, you know, we never had Santa Claus. We had the Christmas angel. And the Christmas angel always brought chestnuts. You know, people say, what did you get for Christmas? Chestnuts. <laughs> chestnuts? What kind of a thing is that to bring you? I don't know. <laughs> But well, we had a lot of fun. We were poor as all get out, but I didn't know it. It was so wonderful. We had so much fun. We laughed a lot. We cried a lot. We did crazy things. I survived. Now, of course, calamari are gourmet foods. <laughs> and if you were to bring it to school and the little things were creepy crawly, people would say, ooh, look at him, you know. It's crazy. But life is not only what you're given, life is how you take what you're given and what you make with it, which means it's up to you to make these wonderful things. There's a beautiful little thing by Paul Kurtz from a book called Exuberance. The title alone makes me happy. He says this, the key to life is its dramatic quality. It's charged with the unexpected, bizarre happenings. You know what it is? You never know the next moment what's going to happen. It's full of constant streams of characters and personalities, richly diverse and idiosyncratic. One has to learn to live then with dramatic suspense. Isn't that wonderful? We're all living not with anxiety, but with dramatic suspense. <laughs> not behold life as a spectator, but participate in it lustily and mightily. Life, however, unlike play acting, is the real thing. The script has not been written beforehand. It is we who do the writing of our parts. And there are many parts that interweave and unfold, and we'll never know the exact ending. Isn't that wonderful? There's always that magical mystery. That is part of the excitement of living. We are forever rewriting our scenario. And new events intrude that we have never anticipated. The full plot is always yet to unfold. For everybody, isn't that exciting? It depends on our, old po our own powers as they spill out upon the world. I love that. So life is what you make it. You can create all kinds of things. Don't believe that you're helpless. You can do it. And I don't believe in luck. And I don't believe in fate. I believe in you, and I believe in me. And it's never too late. You know what you want, and you also know how you can get it. But you've got to give up your false beliefs, and you've got to give up your dead-end streets, and your superficial attachments, and your comfortable habits, and charge ahead. You know, Jane Allen, in a book called Light from Many Lamps, says, the thoughtless and the ignorant and the indolent see only the apparent effects of things and not the things themselves. They talk about luck and fortune and chance. And seeing a man grow rich, they say, how lucky he is. Observing another becoming intellectual, they say, Hi, ha, how highly favored he is. And noting the saintly character and wide influence of another, they say, how chance has aided him at every turn. 
They don't see the trials and the failures and the struggles that these persons have voluntarily encountered in order to gain their experience that changed their lives. They have no knowledge of the sacrifices that have been made, of the undaunted efforts that they've put forth, of the faith that they've exercised, that they might overcome the apparently insurmountable and realize the visions of their hearts. They do not know the darkness and the heartaches. They see only the light and the joy, and they call it good luck. They don't see the long and arduous journeys, but only behold the pleasant goal and call it good fortune. And they don't understand the process, but only perceive the results, and they call it chance. The vision that you glorify in your mind, the ideal that you enthrone in your heart, this will build your life. And this is what you can become if you take responsibility for it. Your greatest challenge is you. Take it. Embrace it. Nobody can do it for you. And it's funny, but on the way, there may be all kinds of ups and downs and valleys and peaks. But so what? They're yours to conquer. Harold Russell, many of you remember him, he was a World War II veteran that lost both hands during the war. And he learned to use hooks with great agility. He made a statement that really had a tremendously profound effect upon my life. He says, it's not what you've lost in life that matters, but what you have left. That's the thing that really matters. Grab hold of that and do it with courage because that's the next thing you're going to have if you're going to join our campaign, and that is you're going to have to have guts. You know, Leo Rostin says, it is the weak who are cruel. Gentleness can only be expected from the strong, and that's the truth. <laughs> you know, I remember a wonderful woman that I used to go visit in a convalescent home all the time. She was so wonderful. She used to say she was never wrong. And you know, I'm beginning to think she wasn't. <laughs> but she said, always remember this, Leo, when things get bad, nothing lasts forever. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> How crazy, but a simple thing like that gave me enormous insight. So you know, when you're in despair, think about it. This isn't going to last forever. You know, uh, if you're hungry, think about it. It's not going to last forever. You're going to get something, even if you have to eat grass. <laughs> this is wonderful. Again, it's written by my favorite author, Anonymous. And it says this. <laughs> if people are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered, have the courage to love them anyway. And if you succeed, you're going to win false friends and true enemies. Have the courage to succeed anyway. And honesty and frankness and forgiveness are going to make you vulnerable. Have the courage to be honest and frank and forgiving anyway. The good you do today, you're going to be told, will be forgotten tomorrow. Have the courage to do good anyway. The biggest people, I love this, the biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest people with the smallest minds. Have the courage to think big anyway. The hell with them. <laughs> what you spend years building can be destroyed overnight. You know, that's the vulnerability of life. But have the courage to build anyway. Give the world the best you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. How often have you heard that? Well, have the courage to get kicked in the teeth anyway. In essence, have the courage to be courageous. But you know, I always think about it when I'm with a group like this, that all of us have known sadness, Everybody in this audience has known what it means to be sad, to be disappointed, to be made to suffer pain, to know cruelty, 
but we've also known joy. Some of us have known ecstasy. Some of us have even known rapture. And that's incredible. But you know, also, if you switch that over, many of us have made people sad. Intentionally, unintentionally. Many of us have given pain to others. Intentionally, unintentionally. Many of us have even been cruel. Intentionally, unintentionally. It's only if you can forgive what is done to you that you can expect then that others will forgive you. And because we all are vulnerable, and we all are those things, we have to learn to let go and to forgive. Because you know what happens when we don't? is we are the ones that are punished. We carry the anger and the devastation around with us all of our lives, and it keeps us from growing. You know, I read an incredible thing in, in the New York Times about a mother who was absolutely, practically destroyed by the murder and the rape, brutally murdered and raped in San Diego of her young daughter who was going to university there. And she couldn't let loose of it. She was angry, she was bitter, she hated everybody. And all at once she realized that she was destroying herself. She couldn't move forward. There was nothing she could do. This memory was hanging over her head like a, a devastating cloud. And pretty soon she thought, you know, I'm going to write to the man who murdered my daughter. I want to know him. I want to see him. And she started writing letters to which he didn't respond, but she was persistent. And finally he wrote back. And after a while she said, may I visit you? And he said, yes. And she went to the prison with her husband. And she describes in a beautiful little book about how he walked in. And she looked at him. And he was a man like other men. He had dark hair, dark eyes. He was clean. He was in his prison uniform. And he looked at her, and he dropped his head. And all at once, there was a feeling of lightness in her soul. And she reached out to him, as did her husband. And he came into their arms, and the three of them wept. And she said, at that moment, I was liberated. And then she went back, and she wrote this thing in the New York Times, and lots of people asked her to come and speak to their group. And she said there was seldom a group in which she spoke where she wasn't attacked as being a stupid, naive woman. You couldn't have loved your girl very much if you forgave that monster. Well, you know what she said? I'm going to leave retribution to heaven. In the meantime, I'm going to forgive. That takes strength and guts. But in a very real sense, forgiving is essential for continued growth. Otherwise, it weighs you down, and we're going to have to forgive the people that hurt us. There's a wonderful old thing that says, you know, uh, uh, love the people that hate you makes them madder than hell. <laughs> I think most of us have had that experience of letting go and saying, I don't understand the behavior. This woman never understood the behavior of this man. How do you understand a man who will brutally rape and murder and torture a young girl? But that was perhaps not for her to understand, just like death is not for us to understand. Pain, despair, misery. You know, I love to say that people love to write me for answers. Let me assure you, I don't have any. They say, oh, Leo, you know this and this and this, and your book helped me so much. Why pain? Why despair? Why must men uh, be so cruel? Whatever it is, why must women desert? Why must this? Why must I write back and say, how the hell should I know? <laughs> I'm dealing with the same thing you're dealing with. Who do you think I am? You know, do you think that when I burp, I emit chimes? <laughs> David Osberger, who's done really the most beautiful work on forgiveness, says we must forgive and forget, that forgetting 
is not a case of holy amnesia which erases the past. Instead, it is the experience of healing which draws the poisons from the wound. You may recall the hurt, but you'll not ever again re relive it. No constant reviewing, no rehashing of the old hurt, no going back to sit on old gravestones where past grievances lie buried. True, the hornet of memory may fly again, but forgiveness has drawn its sting. The curse is gone. The memory is powerless now to arise and to anger. So you're free, and you don't have to spend your life in bitterness. And so tonight, I'm saying to 10,400 incredible lovers with the potential to change the world, to join me so we won't be lonely, in extending ourselves and letting people know the power of love. I want to leave you with this because it's something I'd like you to think about. Have the courage to love. Since love costs nothing to give or to take, you've got nothing to lose. Keep. <laughs> Keep and maintain your sense of humor. You're going to need it because in a crazy world, it's only your insanity that will keep you sane. You've got to be a little nuts to survive. Remember that in spite of the propaganda to the contrary, there's plenty of love about. Feel it tonight. You'd have to be a zombie not to feel the vibrations of love, not to want to turn around and hug everybody in your environment. Boy, would that start it off. <laughs> Remember that in spite of the propaganda to the contrary, there's plenty of love about. Most of us don't find it because we are very particular about finding our kind of love. You're going to look forever. Don't wait for others to bring you love. Be aggressive. Generate it yourself. And don't worry about the fact that your love isn't perfect. I have people telling me when, I, when my love becomes perfect, then I, you know, duh, you'll wait forever. <laughs> Don't worry about the fact that love, your love isn't perfect. If, if a person says that they offer you the perfect love, they're either a liar or a fool, so run like hell. <laughs> and no matter what else you've done of significance, it's a day wasted unless you've laughed, unless you've learned something new, and unless you've found someone or something new to love. <laughs> and finally, love each day as if it were your last because one of these days you're going to be right. <laughs> so ask yourself, as a personal favor to me, why is it so difficult for me to say those three simple little words, I love you. What power. Forget your ego. Get out of your own way. It's time you say to the people in your space, I love you. Oh, what an incredible feeling it gives you. And what an incredible feeling it gives them. And with those feelings, you have the power to soothe and to create and to build and to know what I always say we all must be striving for, rapture. Thank you very much. <laughs>